Please be advised that this serving of aids, the lost voices, may cause offence or upset, as... I've got a bit of a potty mouth. I mean, I can't help it. Well, I can help it, but you know, this subject just gets me so fired up that the odd swear word just falls out every now and again. Anyway, if you've got sensitive ears, or you're around people with sensitive ears, then perhaps tune in later. Don't tune in at all. Pop in some headphones. I don't give a f Anyway, let's get this show started. Roll it. AIDS brings a response Fighting from the government. AIDS, the disease which claims life. Welcome to Extra Tea with your camp host, William Hampson, and my fabulous co-host, Gloria. Between us, we'll be looking back through the decades at how Britain reported on the AIDS pandemic, and where we will try to unpick individual stories in the newspaper archives from the 80s, 90s, and noughties. Ready? Ready. All right, let's do it. Hello, hello. Hey. Gosh, I was just saying to Gloria, actually, as the intro was playing, that it's September 2024. Where has the year gone? Mm, yeah, in a few days, it'll be October, the Halloween season, then Thanksgiving and the Christmas holidays. Well, spooky you mention Christmas. Roll it. Ho, ho, ho! Father Christmas here, struggling to fill your jocks or stockings for that awkward someone this year? Treat them to The Lost Boys of Soho by William Hampson this Christmas. A true story that's so dear. Actually, yeah, that's tacky, tasteless. God, I'm so disappointed in you. All right, calm down, Princess Diana. <laughs> actually, I realized while I booked The Lost Boys of Soho by me, William Hampson would make the perfect jocking fill of this Christmas season. <laughs> really? I realized because this podcast miniseries stares on the internet, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Someone could be listening to this episode while on a beach sunning themselves during the Easter holidays mm. or, you know, sat in their car on a bank holiday uh. or... That could even if someone is listening to no, AIDS, the Lost really Voices, nice. while on their holidays, then you need to find some friends. <laughs> Says you messaging me the other day saying you loved the episode on um, music composer John Lewis. Yes, because I wasn't in it. Oh, uh, probably explains why it's the highest rated. I'm joking, You're I'm joking. I couldn't bitch. do this without you, Gloria. Oh, I love you. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, are you going to start us off? Yes. The first article we're looking at is from London's Evening Standard on March 20th, 1986. AIDS scare at London court. With the strap line, don't put them in spitting distance, says magistrate. Yes, because this episode is going to have a bit of a prison theme. And this article from March 1986, and the article reads... Two confirmed AIDS victims caused a scare at a London court today when they were due to appear on shoplifting charges. Police were reluctant to bring them into the court at Horse Ferry Road for fear that officers might catch the killer disease. But magistrate Mrs Evangeline Hunter-Jones insisted that jobless Jimmy Murray, 21, and Gillian Hampton, also 21, appeared in the dock. But she added, quote, We would rather not be within spitting distance. The magistrate is doing nothing for stigma around AIDS in 1986, is she? Oh, absolutely not. But it doesn't end there, because the article goes on to state... Police told the magistrate that the two accused had been cut during a struggle after their arrest at Harrods on Wednesday. Quote, So the risk of infection is increased, a police jailer told the magistrate. I would suggest that you deal with the matter downstairs in the custody area. But, Mrs Hunter-Jones said, this is a court of law and it is only fair that they should be tried in an open court, not in the cells. She makes no sense. No, I don't think she does because... She fears AIDS and saliva because she's not in possession of the facts around AIDS and how it's transmitted even in 1986. But she's happy to subject everyone in the court to the risk that she herself perceives in the pursuit to humiliate the pair, not only for their crime, but the fact all and sundry now know they have AIDS. Mm. Anyhow, the article goes on to state, she, the magistrate, She told police the bench would agree to have the defendants handcuffed or even hooded. No way. So long as they are not gagged. That's awful. She added, I would ask everybody to go away from court unless they don't mind the risk of catching AIDS. (laughs) Oh, this woman. The two from Clapham were charged with stealing two figurines worth £294. Harrods detectives and other staff involved in the arrest were due to have AIDS checks. How she thought people would catch AIDS in court is mind-boggling. Especially given the routes of transmission were known in 1986, you know, needles, sex and blood transfusions. Yeah. And I'd like to think none of those acts were going to take place in an open court. Exactly. Just ridiculous. Were the pair just charged and not sentenced? Well, it's weird that you even have to ask, but I mean, you're right to ask. 
But I can confirm that the, the pair were charged. Okay. And on the same day, the judge also sentenced the pair of them to 30 days imprisonment each. Now, the Evening Standard was the only paper that reported on the story on the day the pair were in court. I think it's clear the AIDS angle for the Evening Standard was more of a story for them than the crime and the punishment itself. Ah. And the next day, the story, as you can imagine, makes it into many of the national newspapers, including the tabloids. But... As always, the Daily Telegraph really gives an accurate insight into the circumstances that led the pair to be in court. Under the headline on the 21st of March 1985, AIDS carriers flicked blood at Harrods security staff. The article reads, A couple who each stole a china figurine from Harrods were led into court yesterday by policemen wearing plastic gloves because they are both carriers of the killer disease AIDS. Jimmy Murray and his girlfriend Gillian Hampton, both 21, were, quote, Modern day lepers shunned by society, their solicitor, Mr. Stephen Dawson, told Horseferry Road magistrates. The couple, living in a hotel in Argyle Square, King's Cross, were both injured during struggles when they were arrested on Wednesday. Hampton had to have four stitches and a cut on her hand caused by a piece of smashed china. The court heard that eight members of Harrods staff were due to have AIDS checks. A woman star detective had been smeared with blood after Hampton had flicked blood from a wound towards security staff. Mrs. Evangeline Hunter-Jones, chairman of the bench, asked if the probation service would have any objections to trying to find a hospice or some form of treatment for the couple. Mr. Nicholas Moore, probation officer, replied, I don't know. It isn't our normal function. Mr. Dawson told the court, Treatment is not available. Their lives are probably going to be extremely short. They are in what may be termed as a race against time. Police Sergeant Graham Davis had said they had a 1 in 10 chance of dying from the disease. After the magistrates adjourned for 20 minutes, Mrs Hunter-Jones told them, quote, In view of the gravity of the offence and your records, and that the probation service don't feel able to help you, we are going to give you 30 days imprisonment. We hope this will be mostly in the hospital wing, where we hope there will be a doctor who will be able to help you. What you need is someone to tell you how much time you have. Ha. Huh. The couple, who had pleaded guilty to the £294 theft, had been kept in a locked police van before being brought into court. (sighs) Police had asked the magistrates to hear the case in the court's cells because of the risk of infection. Before the case was called, however, she announced, I would ask everybody to leave this court unless they don't mind the risk of catching AIDS. The couple, Murray with his arm in a sling, both looked pale and drawn. Quote, Their lives are completely taken over by the terrible disease. Mr. Dawson said. And do you know what happened to Jimmy and Gillian after? Well, I couldn't find anything more about them in the newspaper archives, perhaps further court appearances or incidents they were perhaps involved in. And I couldn't find anything on Jimmy Murray and government records, neither under Jim, Jamie, James or Jimmy. But Gillian Patricia Hampton, however, I found she sadly passed away in Islington in London in 1991, aged only 27 years old. So young. And this next article relates to a young prisoner transferred from Wormwood Scrubs to Camp Hill on the Isle of Wight in February 1985. Mm. And if you recall in the John Lewis episode, Brian Hodgson and recalled how quickly the press had moved on from their attention in reporting John's death uh-huh. and other AIDS-related stories. Yeah. Because in February 1985, it was a busy month in the press as John Lewis, the music composer, had sadly passed away along with several other men at the same Bristol hospital. Chris Egner, he had also died, and the press were reporting on an AIDS scare with 40 haemophiliacs. Someone at the BBC Television Centre had died of AIDS but had been allowed to continue working before his death. The Reverend Gregory Richards, who we're discussing next, his death caused immediate sensation. And then in the prison service, officers went on strike when this next man and a few others were suspected as having AIDS. AIDS. And they're just from the episodes we've produced. Exactly, but there is no escape in that February 1985 was a busy month in the newspapers. In another scare involving the killer disease AIDS, prison officers at Britain's largest jail have banned the transfer of all prisoners in and out. They've effectively sealed off Wormwood Scrubs in London because a prisoner who left there earlier this week is thought to have had AIDS. The government's chief medical officer has appealed to people not to panic about AIDS. Chances of catching the disease remain slight, he says. London's Evening Standard first reported this next story on February 15th, 1985, with the headline, Fury at AIDS Alert Prison. Mm, And it reads, 
Frightened prison officers on the Isle of Wight were today demanding urgent health checks after a homosexual prisoner was transferred from a London jail with suspected AIDS. Officers at Campbell Prison also called for a top-level Home Office investigation into why medical staff at Wormwood Scrubs failed to spot the symptoms of the killer disease. The Category C prison on the Isle of Wight, used as a remand and training centre, has imposed a total ban on the movement of prisoners while Home Office medical officers attempt to establish whether the man in his mid-twenties is a definite AIDS victim. Prison Officers Association branch chairman Jim White said today, quote, from what we have been told by our own chief medical officer on the island, it is very probable that the prisoner has AIDS. We are scared stiff and are taking no chances. Mr. White said his members were, quote, disgusted <sighs> that the man had been transferred to Camp Hill on Wednesday. Quote, proper medical checks should have been carried out at Wormwood Scrubs before he left. We're furious that no one at that end spotted his symptoms. A Home Office spokesman said, Quote, prison staff have been informed that the risk of catching AIDS is remote for anyone who is not in one of the high risk groups. Hospital for tests. I assume that means that the, the man in question has gone to hospital for tests. And this story grows as the next day it makes the national newspapers. Yes, the Daily Mirror, the Daily Telegraph and the Guardian to name just a few. But it's the Daily Telegraph that gives us the finer details as to how this alert, as they term it, came to be. Okay. Now, a portion of the article states... The statement came on a day a prisoner in Camp Hill on the Isle of Wight was transferred to Southampton General Hospital for tests for suspected AIDS. It will be a few days before tests verify whether he has contracted it. He arrived from Wormwood Scrubs with other prisoners on Wednesday and doctors giving him a routine medical examination on admission to Camp Hill were alerted by symptoms he displayed. He was immediately put into isolation, but the local prison officers association expressed concern for their members who had searched the man and came into bodily contact with him before his tests. The authorities at Camp Hill have sought to reassure staff that they are unlikely to have been at risk, a home office spokesman said yesterday. This fact is endorsed by experience in the American prison system where considerable numbers of AIDS sufferers are held. Mm, I mean, we know today, and they knew in 1986, you couldn't be infected with HIV AIDS from mere touch alone. Yeah. And the routes of transmission known today were known then. So why this fuss, I don't understand. Mm. But while this man is not named and the story rumbles on for a few more days, we then get to hear from the man concerned. Huh. Because on the 20th of February 1985, it's a national newspaper, The Guardian, under the headline, AIDS Suspect in Fear of Ghoul, states, The prisoner being treated for AIDS at Southampton General Hospital yesterday said he was terrified of being sent back to Campbell Gull on the Isle of Wight. Stephen Hayward, aged 28, said, quote, I am going to be treated like the Yorkshire Ripper. Shunned by everyone, I will be a leper. Please don't send me back. In a telephone interview from his bed in the hospital's isolation unit, Mr. Hayward from Hampstead, London, said, quote, They are using me to give the Home Office an ultimatum to get all homosexuals transferred into one prison. I have been made a scapegoat for an excuse to clean up the prison. Mr. Hayward, who is married with a five-year-old son, said he first suspected that he had AIDS last year after his flatmate's boyfriend died of the disease. He had taken free tests for antibodies to the AIDS virus and had told the prison medical officer at Wormwood Scrubs about it before being transferred to Camp Hill, he added. He described himself as bisexual, a model well known in the gay world and the son of a wealthy family. Quote, when I first heard I might have AIDS, I started sweating and trembling. I thought, oh my God, I am going to die. Now I am more frightened that if the tests are positive, they will send me back to Camp Hill. They make you feel so shameful about it. They think if they touch you, they will die. I'd say prison isn't meant to be enjoyable, but it does sound as though he's being treated unfairly, even after being told he tested HIV negative. Absolutely. And as you say, Stephen tested negative for HIV. And if you were wondering what was wrong with Stephen, I did wonder. the Observer newspaper reported on the 24th of February 1985 that tests at the hospital confirmed Stephen had nothing more than a throat infection and not AIDS, <laughs> as the prison service was stating. But I can't help but wonder as well if Stephen just so didn't want to go to this prison that maybe did he? I know that. I think we're all thinking it, no? Yeah. So I, I certainly am anyway. Right. 
In this next story, we're going to be looking at the Reverend Gregory Richards, okay. who first appears in the British press after travelling from Australia on the 10th of December 1976. Under the headline, Hot Under the Dog Collar, <laughs> the article reads, The Reverend Gregory Richards, Bedfont's new globetrotting vicar, has a confession to make. Huh. Ooh. <laughs> During part of the 13,000 miles from Australia to his new post as assistant at St Mary's the Virgin, he left his dog collar off. To spare the blushes of his fellow travellers, and perhaps those of himself, Bachelor, Mr Richards, 30, travelled, as it were, incognito. It was on the last leg of the journey when he joined 21 others on an overland expedition. Quote, I left my collar off as I thought I might inhibit the others. He explained at his new home in Benedict Drive, Bedfont. Quote, Some people feel that with a vicar among them, they can't smoke, drink, swear or be themselves. But he thinks his companions may have discovered his secret when he kept nipping off to go to church. <laughs> he plans to spend two years in Bedfont before moving on to Europe. And this next story was first reported on January 31st, 1985. That's right. This is London's Evening Standard reporting the death of Reverend Richards. But it is the following day when there is much more accurate reporting. Okay. I wasn't going to read the Daily Mirror's front page story, but I think it demonstrates to those not old enough to remember or experience just how the tabloids reported. The Daily Mirror on February 1st, 1985, print a photo of the Reverend on the front page with the headline, Boys Jail Chaplain Dies of AIDS. And it reads, A prison chaplain with 200 boys in his care has died of AIDS. Bachelor Gregory Richards, 38, who worked at Chelmsford Jail, Essex, was Britain's 52nd victim of the dreaded and incurable, quote, gay plague. Last night, a major alert was declared in Chelmsford sad. and Essex Hospital where he died. His body was sealed in a plastic bag and put in a deep freezer. Oh, District that's... Health Officer, Dr. Tony Kirkland, banned a post-mortem. He said, quote, I will not put staff at risk. Strict precautions have oh, been man. taken to prevent the spread of the disease. Compare that with how the Daily Telegraph reported on the story under their headline, AIDS Kills Prison Chaplain. The Reverend Gregory Richards, chaplain to the Young Offenders Unit at Chelmsford Prison, died in hospital from cardiac arrest yesterday after contracting the disease AIDS. The bachelor clergyman, who was also chaplain at Bullwood Hall, an institution for young girls at Hockley, Essex, was admitted to Chelmsford and Essex Hospital on the 17th of January. His family thought he had pneumonia, but 24 hours before his death, it was confirmed he had AIDS. AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, began among the homosexual community in San Francisco and New York. Dr. Tony Kirkland, district medical officer for Mid-Essex, said it was not possible to say whether Mr. Richards was, quote, a practicing homosexual, although this is the commonest way of contracting the disease. Mr. Richards was in a semi-coma throughout his time in hospital and was made the subject of what is known as, quote, barrier nursing. This means that any nurse going into his isolation room would have to wear a gown, mask and gloves, which would be taken off immediately afterwards. Mr. Richards' body was sealed in a plastic bag immediately after his death and put in cold storage until his relatives decide on either burial or cremation. An attempt to trace the clergyman's associates has been abandoned. Dr. Kirkland said, quote, We have been advised there is no point in trying to track them down. Mr. Richards, 38, came from South Australia and joined the prison service in 1979. He worked with teenage offenders at Wormwood Scrubs and later moved to Camp Hill Prison, Isle of Wight, before being transferred to Chelmsford in 1982. He lived in a semi-detached house in Sanford Road, Chelmsford, which backed onto the prison. His parents were first notified when he became ill and flew to Britain, but they were too distraught to talk last night. A massive difference in tone and language. Yeah, less sensationalist. I agree. I mean, if there is a story to report here, and given the AIDS pandemic, I think there is a public interest. Yeah. Do you do it calmly? Exactly. In an informative, calm manner? Or, like the tabloids, use language that creates or, by this time, stokes the rhetoric and stigma around the virus? Exactly. The Daily Telegraph shared the Reverend's role at the institutions without making it sound seedy mm. or hinting to the rhetoric around gay men before AIDS came along. Gay men and young boys, which then becomes gay men with AIDS and then, you know, all your kids are in danger. <sighs> when you look at the media as a whole in the 1980s, no internet, no social media, just radio, television and newspapers, yeah. you never heard reporting like the Daily Mirror on the radio or the TV. 
just the newspapers, particularly the tabloids. Uh-huh. I mean, it is clear who is responsible for the HIV stigma that still exists when it's informing the general population at the time. And I mean, I should know I am experiencing it in the workplace really? as we speak. <laughs> That's another story. And the Daily Mirror the next day, February 2nd, 1985, run the headline, Nurses in AIDS Checkup. Mm, and it reads... Two young nurses who looked after AIDS victim chaplain Gregory Richards were told to have special blood tests yesterday. The tests were ordered after it was discovered that the girls had tiny cuts which could have exposed them to infection from the deadly, quote, gay plague. Oh, do you know, the Daily Mirror really trying to tug at the heartstrings of its dippy readers (laughs) while referencing these nurses as, quote, young and, quote, girls wow oh do you know it's just it's just stalking the stigma isn't it uh-huh. that, oh but if it wasn't serious you could laugh as on the same day the daily telegraph reported as did the daily mirror in in the article quote communion cup uses fear <laughs> communion cup oh, no. uses fear aids come on are you serious Oh, fasten your seatbelts. Okay. Dr. Tony Kirkland, district officer for Mid-Essex, said yesterday that following the AIDS death of the Reverend Gregory Richards, his department had received several calls from, quote, eminently respectable church ladies no way. who had used the same communion cup as the chaplain. He said, quote, they are obviously worried that they may have picked up the infection. Hmm. But I can assure them there is absolutely nothing for them to worry about. If only he could have given Magistrate Hunter Jones the same advice the following year. Yes, because this story is in February 1985, and the story we covered at the top of the episode of Jimmy Murray and Gillian Hampton, this is 13 months later in March 1986, yeah. where the magistrate is sending out the message that there is a connection between AIDS and saliva. Mm. Either she believed it, which would be worrying for a magistrate to be that dense, yeah. or she was just being a total bitch. And there are fresh news reports on a daily basis. Yes, just as you would expect, it doesn't stop. It just goes uh. on and on and on. Like, for example, on Sunday the 3rd of February 1985, the Daily Mirror has the headline, AIDS priests double life, nights in gay clubs. Why are they all so, so predictable? Yes, and why are gay people so interesting, you know? <laughs> why do they have to keep reporting on it? I think they must have learned it from their Fleet Street book of homophobia because yeah. with anybody gay, they're bound to have visited a gay club and that means they are leading a double life. I mean, I don't know. And that's all this article states, that after work, Richard is allegedly visiting gay clubs and pubs in London's West End. And good on him, I say. Exactly. And I suspect they've spoken to many who knew or, or saw him. Where, they state in one article, one young, that word young hmm. again, homosexual who met him several times said, quote, he was a very discreet gay, never outrageous, but he couldn't help attracting attention because he was so good looking, just like a movie star. A home office spokesman said, quote, He kept his private life to himself and there was never any complaints about the way he performed his duties. The Daily Mirror are really going to great lengths to try and find some scandal. Mm, I think, yeah, by the quotes, you can tell that they're being very intrusive in the questions they're asking, aren't they? And they must have been so disappointed because there are clearly no skeletons in Richard's closet. Uh And in their sister paper, The Sunday People, on the same day... 3rd of February 1985, under the headline, Barricades Threats in AIDS Fear Jail. It states, Terrified young offenders are threatening to barricade themselves in their prison cells unless they get blood tests following the death of their chaplain from AIDS. They want to be certain that they have not caught the killer gay plague from the popular padre, Gregory Richards. The worried mother of one inmate said yesterday, quote, The atmosphere is terrible. The lads are scared stiff. The next day, February 4th, the Evening Post and the Daily Mirror report the funeral plans. Mm. The Evening Post under the headline, AIDS Deaf Priest to be Cremated, and the article states, The Reverend Gregory Richards, the prison chaplain who died of AIDS, is to be cremated secretly tomorrow. A brief service will be conducted by the Bishop of Bradwell, the Right Reverend Derek Bond. The only mourners will be Mr Richards' mother June and his stepfather, who came from their home in Australia to visit their son as he was dying in hospital after a two-week illness. A public memorial service will be held on Friday. The hospital room in which Mr Richards died of the incurable disease AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, was still sealed yesterday. Ah. Mr Richards, age 38, was chaplain to more than 250 young offenders at the Chelmsford Prison Essex for the past three years. Prison Officers Association Branch Secretary, Mr Phil Hill, 
said today some inmates and staff had asked about any possible risk to their health from the case. He said, quote, They have received categoric assurances by the health authorities that they are in no danger whatsoever. He denied reports that young people at the prison had threatened violence unless they were tested to make sure that they had not contracted the disease. No tests had been carried out. And remember I said at the top of the episode that February 1985 was a busy month for AIDS-related stories in the press? Yeah. Well, the next day on the 5th of February 1985, The Guardian, under the headline AIDS warning going to all blood donors, covers several stories, including one on Reverend Gregory Richards. Okay. And it starts off by saying, Leaflets warning people at risk of AIDS not to give blood are being sent to the homes of every donor in the country, the Department of Health said yesterday. Now, this wasn't because of Chris Egner, who we spoke about in a previous episode, okay. but mounting concerns over what we know today to be the infected blood scandal. And there was also another story within this same article about a Mr. Colin Beaton who died of AIDS-related complications after receiving a kidney and a blood transfusion in America. The article also covers the Reverend Gregory Richards and how the laboratory that came to take a blood sample from Gregory while he was in hospital had not been told by his doctor that they at the time suspected AIDS. And the article states, Laboratory staff were not told. A technician took a blood sample from the patient without wearing protective clothing. No special precautions were taken in the laboratories. We've said this before. Why? Why wouldn't they be protecting themselves from all other known bloodborne viruses? You know, just the mind boggles. I don't understand it at all. Maybe because those other viruses didn't carry the same level of shame or, or stigma that HIV AIDS did. You know, especially when it, you know, anybody who gets it is automatically assumed to be to be gay. Back in the eighties, you know, if somebody even jokingly called somebody gay, you know, it didn't, <laughs> didn't always end very well. Anyhow, the article goes on to state. Another AIDS victim died yesterday at the isolation unit at Ham Green Hospital, Bristol. He was a 40-year-old homosexual from Bath. Now, he wasn't from Bath, we established that, because we covered the amazing John Lewis and his story a few episodes back. But this isn't an exhaustive list, but you can see how busy February 1985 was for AIDS-related stories in the press. It's just one after another. On February 6th, 1985, with the previous threats of a barricade by prisoners reported in the Daily Mirror, they now run the headline, Prison Siege Over AIDS. Yes, although the headline is slightly misleading. Now, the Daily Telegraph gives us a more accurate account. Okay. And the article reads... Prison officers stopped the movement of young prisoners to and from Chelmsford Jail yesterday after the body of the Reverend Gregory Richards, 38, the homosexual prison chaplain who died of AIDS, was cremated. The Home Office stressed there was no need for panic about the disease prevalent among homosexuals and it was unnecessary to quarantine the jail. However, officials will be meeting representatives of the Prison Officers Association today for talks. The prison officers want a full explanation of the risks of AIDS. Hospital workers who handled specimens and blood samples from Mr. Richards have also demanded an inquiry. Ah. About 10 young offenders from Chelmsford were refused admission to youth custody centres at Wellingborough, North Hants and Onley near Rugby yesterday. They went back to Chelmsford. Mr. Colin Steele, chairman of the association, said last night, quote, The mere mention of AIDS strikes sheer terror into people and our members are obviously very worried. The 160 officers at Chelmsford have been instructed not to move any prisoners nor accept arrivals from other prisons. All we are asking for is clarification on the risks involved. The prison authorities have known about it for more than 10 days, but we are still in the dark. Officers want screening and blood tests following the death of Mr. Richards last week, just 24 hours after AIDS had been diagnosed. He had previously been said to have pneumonia. A Home Office spokesman denied suggestions that there was a rush to move prisoners out of Chelmsford. Dr Tony Kirkland, medical officer for Mid-Essex, has told us there is no reason for further tests at the jail and has given us no indication of the need for quarantine, the spokesman said. Dr Kirkland went to the prison to meet staff yesterday. He said, quote, There has been a bit of a panic reaction. Yeah. I want to allay the fears that have arisen and reassure everyone at the prison that there is nothing for them to worry about. There is no evidence to suggest that Mr. Richards may have passed on his disease to anyone at the prison and there is no need for blood tests. Well said. Oh, that's the first good thing he's said. I agree. Mr. Richards, 
his body sealed in plastic, was cremated on Monday evening after normal hours in a back room of Chelmsford Crematorium. Oh, no. Staff in protective clothing were given a two-page list of safety precautions. Oh, man. A handful of mourners watched from a doorway and the room afterwards was sprayed with a powerful disinfectant. Oh, that's really sad to hear. Really sad. Such an overreaction, even for 1986. Oh, do you know, it's really hard to get your head around, because it's 1986. You know, the government, by 1982, whether they believed it when they were saying it, or whether they were just hoping it to be true when they were saying it, but by 1982, off the back of America, we knew how HIV AIDS was contracted. Mm. You know, it had to be through sexual contact. It wasn't through saliva. You know, it had to be through bodily fluids. Uh You know, sexual intercourse, through needles. It was well known and established. So by 1986, it's quite difficult to understand how people were so stupid they couldn't get it into their head. Good point. I don't mean to be crude or graphic, and I know guidelines stated it, and the reporting clearly as well, you know, stated it, Mm. that the body is wrapped in plastic. You know, and it's placed within a wooden coffin. So why or who made these people think that they were going to catch AIDS from sitting in a small room with a coffin that contained a body that's wrapped in plastic that you can have zero contact with? You know, the lid sealed, it's closed. Yeah. I just don't... It's just the British press, the newspapers, the tabloids. They surely are the people that need to be held to account for causing all this stigma Uh they weren't reporting this on bbc news they weren't reporting this on radio stations you know the press just seemed to have a a reign of their own just to say what they want it's just it's what we'd call today fake news Mm, yeah even i can remember in the 80s and 90s when people always said you know you should never believe what you read in the papers and it was a phrase that was ingrained in british culture it was a phrase that was often cited by comedians soap stars talk show hosts Mm. and it's just bizarre that people did believe that you could catch HIV AIDS just through touching someone or being in the same room as a coffin containing a body that had sadly passed away from AIDS or AIDS related complications yeah. it's just ugh and despite the accounts that we heard at the crematorium service, um, which all sounded very undignified, they did mention that there would be a memorial service where people could come together to memorialise the Reverend Gregory mm. Richards, and that does take place. And it's reported in the Sydney Morning Herald, the Australian newspaper, on the 10th of February 1985. And the article states, The Australian parents of the Reverend Gregory Richards, the 37-year-old prison chaplain who died of AIDS last month, sat weeping with their heads bowed at a memorial service ah. yesterday while tributes were being paid to their son. One tribute from a girl at a local barstool said, quote, Greg was no saint, but he spoke for the saints and took their message into the darkest places. Alex and June Burgess flew from Sydney to be among 300 mourners at the service in Chelmsford, Essex, following their son's death 10 days ago. The minister who conducted the service said Mr and Mrs Burgess had been, quote, bitterly disappointed, end quote, with the press coverage of their son's death. Mr Richard's death was front page news in Britain's mass circulation popular newspapers under headlines such as, quote, Gay plague kills priests. But, as the service took place, a row broke out among prison officers and their union. The union has threatened to stop the movement of prisoners throughout Britain unless the government agrees to carry out medical checks for possible cases of AIDS among inmates in the dead chaplain's prison at Chelmsford. A union representative said that officers were in danger because they might catch the virus by physical contact with inmates oh, suffering from unrecognised cases of AIDS. It doesn't sound good, oh, does it? Now Gregory is laid to rest at peace. I hope this is the end of all the press reports. To a degree, yes. But as the AIDS pandemic rumbles on, Gregory is often cited along with other similar AIDS-related cases or stories within ah. the media. And remember I mentioned some of the staff at the hospital yeah. were not happy they'd not been told Gregory was suspected of having AIDS when they were uh-huh. drawing blood. Well, on the 7th of February 1985, the Daily Telegraph reports preliminary findings of the complaints made under the headline, Series of Blunders, Staff Not Told. And the article states, Dr Tony Kirkland, District Health Officer for Mid-Essex, admitted yesterday that staff at the Chelmsford and Essex Hospital should have been told that the Reverend Gregory Richards, 38, who died of AIDS last week, was a suspected victim of the disease. Okay. Union officials at the hospital have accused the area health authorities of, quote, malpractice over the case. Mr Brian Bolton, Vice Secretary, Mid-Essex branch of NUP, listed a catalogue of alleged blunders at the hospital where the clergyman was treated and died. Staff caring for the dying man were not told for five days that AIDS was suspected. 
soiled bedding and medical equipment used in the case were left lying around for several days before it was burned. Equipment used to clean his room was later used on a general ward. A nurse who handled blood samples pricked her finger on a drip needle used on the clergyman. And this was also reported over in Australia in the Sydney Morning Herald with additional detail where it states... Really? About 25 patients and 20 staff at the hospital in Chelmsford are thought to have come into contact with the 38-year-old bachelor but were not told of the risk. Urgent tests were carried out yesterday on two porters who handled Mr Richards, believing he was suffering from pneumonia. He accidentally urinated over them and it contacted cuts on the men's hands. Oh, ah. God, ridiculous. Why report that? Yeah. Then you kind of got the undignified side that, you know, oh, he accidentally urinated on the part uh. as well. We, again, we heard that he was in this form of coma, so he probably hasn't got control of his yeah. body functions. But again, why is nobody sat at the desk thinking, actually, this is not really insight that we need to share with uh-huh. the general public? It's so undignified. I agree. Oh, it's just overkill. It's just, you know, it just makes me... You can see why his parents would be angry. Yeah. And the Guardian newspaper reported the same story with additional detail, where it states, Mr. Richards, who was admitted suffering pneumonia, was nursed in an open ward for two days. Dr. Kirkland said, quote, It was two days before AIDS was suspected and he was put in isolation. All the necessary precautions were taken. The government's chief medical officer, Dr Donald Aikson, rebutted what was described as exaggerated accounts of the infectious nature of AIDS. Quote, You cannot get it from sitting in the same room as or sharing a meal with a person with AIDS since it is not transmitted through the air by coughing and sneezing, nor can you get it by shaking hands. As government advice goes, he's spot on. Mm, It would just have been a little bit more helpful if they'd have dished it out earlier and and more frequently. Uh And well-known gay activist at the time, Andrew Britton, wrote as much in his lengthy piece for The Guardian on the 8th of February 1985, highlighting how the Reverend Gregory Richard's sexuality, diagnosis and death had been covered by the British press, where he concludes, Moral panics feed on mystery and the myth of the, quote, gay plague could so easily take hold because the information about what AIDS is and how it is contracted is not being made available. The secrecy in which the Reverend Richard's illness was shrouded after his admission to hospital, while no doubt intended precisely to prevent the spread of lurid horror, has been readily construed in every tabloid headline as a means of concealing the threat to which, quote, the community is exposed. The community is threatened not by AIDS or gay men, but by the atmosphere of the terrified irrationality which the right-wing press is now assiduously generating and from which the medical profession is not disassociating itself as clearly as it should. It is, correspondingly, an urgent political priority that the facts about AIDS and its relation to homosexuality should be publicly established as soon as possible. All of the actual newspaper articles mentioned in this serving are available on the Extra Tea blog. You can find the link below in the show notes. If you've enjoyed listening to AIDS, The Lost Voices, then don't be a shady bitch and show us some love with a big fat like, a comment, a share, as in the link, not as in do you believe in life after love, oh. And for fuck's sake, don't forget to subscribe and follow. <laughs>